and welcome to the very last video in this series. We are going to finish up Unit 8, Ecology, and in this video, this is video 4, we're looking at Biodiversity 8.6 and Disruptions to the Ecosystem 8.7. Okay, let's get a little bit more complicated here. Let's talk about trophic cascades. So over on the left, you can see a diagram. Um, and there are diagrams like this, um, if they're just showing sort of one direction, it's showing a trophic cascade. You might see very similar diagrams to this showing arrows going in multiple directions that would be considered a food web. Um, but this is a trophic cascade where we're just looking at sort of one directional effects. It's important to recognize that all species in a community impact others, and some have a net positive effect, some have a net negative effect. Figuring out whether it's a positive or negative effect um, might change over time. It might change um, based on environmental conditions. But we're going to try to simplify these and think about overall, in general, is there a positive versus negative effect. This diagram doesn't distinguish that. So I want to get practice, I want to give you some practice thinking about net positive, net negative relationships. By stating or drawing symbols, it would be appropriate to represent either net positive or net negative re relationships between wolves and elk, elk and woody plants, and woody plants and birds. So wolves negatively impact elk. You can show that with either an inhibition arrow or a negative sign. Elk negatively impact woody plants, and woody plants positively impact birds. Um, positive impacts can be shown either with an arrow or with a plus sign. So you should be familiar with both of these ways of representing net positive and net negative relationships. Based on these direct relationships that we've just shown with these um, activation inhibition arrows or the plus and minuses, predict the effect of wolves on elk predict the effect of wolves on wood, woody plants, and the effect of wolves on birds. So here we're moving from direct effects, like wolves to elk, to indirect effects, wolves to woody plants and wolves to birds. Wolves directly cause the elk population to decrease because wolves prey on elk. Wolves indirectly cause woody plant populations to increase. Elk feed on woody plants and trample the saplings, so therefore when there are fewer elk, the plants are better able to survive. So we have wolves to elk are negative, elk to plants are negative, therefore wolves to plants are positive. Because if there are more wolves, there are fewer elk, and if there are fewer elk, then there are more plants. So if you have kind of a negative and a negative, that gives you an indirect positive relationship. Wolves also indirectly cause many bird populations to increase, and that's because woody plants positively impact birds. So we just explained why wolves positively impact the woody plants, so if there are more woody plants, that's good for the birds. So wolves indirectly cause many bird populations to increase. In addition to these effect on population sizes, there are um, other effects that organisms can have on the environment. For example, um, when there are no wolves around, elk tend to hang out by the rivers more because um, they don't have to worry about predation as much. They can hang out in sort of unprotected areas in the rivers. That causes uh, more erosion at the rivers. It causes the rivers to um, have, they're, they're more stirred up, and that actually negatively affects fish. So it's not that the um, elk are impacting population sizes that affects the fish. It's um, through sort of indirect abiotic factors. So um, looking at communities, communities, um, you have to look at both population impacts as well as behavioral impacts to understand the full story. So as we said before, all species in a community impact others. But some species, like wolves in this example, have a particularly large effect. These large effects are often due to trophic cascades. A uh, trophic cascade is an important, um, important concept, so I want you to try to explain what a trophic cascade is, and also, what's the name, what's the term for a species that has a particularly large impact on a community? It's a keystone species, is the term referring to a, a species that has a particularly large effect on its community. So in that last example, wolves would be considered a keystone species.
A trophic cascade is a series of interactions across multiple trophic levels. So for example, in this diagram, you can see um, that the bear is being used as an example of a tertiary consumer or an apex predator, um, which then consumes many of the secondary consumers, which are also predators. Those secondary consumers consume herbivores, and those herbivores consume plants. Now this is a very simplified diagram. If we were looking at a food web, there would actually be many more complicated relationships. But we can look at this, we can kind of oversimplify this, and say that generally bears have a negative impact on secondary consumers. Generally secondary consumers have a negative impact on primary consumers. And primary consumers have a negative impact on the producers. But if we look at those indirect effects, remember that sort of two negatives essentially make a positive. Because if you have more bears, that's going to be fewer secondary consumers, which is going to be good news for those herbivores. And so that's why there's that dashed line showing the plus, is that's showing a positive indirect effect. Again, this is an oversimplification, really looking at um, individual relationships rather than just large trophic levels would be better to understand this. It's also important to point out that in addition to these top-down cascades, um, we also have bottom-up effects. So for example, if the environmental conditions are good for plants, if you've got lots of plants growing, that's going to be good news for herbivores. So you'll have more energy flowing up um, through the trophic levels from bottom up. Let's go on now to the very final section of AP Biology, which is 8.7, and we're looking at disruptions to the ecosystem. So a bit of review to put in context, I want, to be, I want to remind you that mutations randomly introduce variation and that natural selection can act on that variation. What this leads to is adaptations. It's a reminder that adaptation is a genetic variation that's favored by selection and is manifested as a trait that provides an advantage to an organism in a particular environment, which means that over time populations are going to be well adapted to their environments. However, this match can be disturbed, it can be disrupted. If something changes in the ecosystem, then that match between the environment, both abiotic and biotic factors, and the traits of an individual, physical, physiological, behavioral, that match can get disrupted. All organisms in an ecosystem are interdependent, so even one single change can have a ripple effect. A change to one biotic or abiotic factor can have far-reaching effects. So what are some things that can disrupt the ecosystem? There are three major categories of disruptions to an ecosystem. What are they? Three major categories are human impacts, geological and meteorological activity, and invasive species. Now invasive species, it's important to point out, invasive species can happen on their own, um, but humans actually uh, have a large impact on invasive species as well. Humans often introduce species to new uh, ecological areas. So let's talk about um, sort of the first step in um, fixing disruptions is actually preventing disruptions. So I want to give you a couple of examples. An example of ways that humans can help prevent disruptions is um, with zebra mussels. Zebra mussels are a really small mussel that's an invasive species in the U.S. These have a really large impact on lake ecosystems. They're very small. They can um, clog uh, pipes. They can encrust all sorts of other um, species. Um, and so this has uh, far-reaching effects. Um, it reduces phytoplankton, reduces zooplankton, um, reduces a lot of the, the sort of native fish in a lake, and so can have really detrimental effects. The best way to deal with zebra mussels is to never let them into the lake in the first place. And so to try to keep some of our lake's zebra mussels free, um, many organizations have started clean, drain, and dry campaigns. And this has successfully helped reduce their spread. There are a lot of lakes that um, would have zebra mussels in them, but the zebra mussels are caught before they're ever actually brought into the lake. And so if boats are cleaned, are drained, are dry, when they go from one lake to another, it can prevent the sort of hitchhiking of invasive species. Some ecosystems are more resilient than others. To help understand this, let's go back a little bit and review what makes a population more resilient to disruption. 
Populations that have large population size and large genetic diversity are more resilient. So cheetahs was an example of a um, population with very low genetic diversity, and it's one reason that they're endangered. Using the same reasoning on populations, what would be the corollary on an ecosystem? What do you think would be a factor that increases the, eco the resilience of an ecosystem? Ecosystems with a high species diversity are more resilient to disturbances. There's actually current research going on on this right now. There's some debate about how big of an impact this effect can have, but the most recent research is showing that yes, ecosystems with high species diversity are more resilient to disturbances. Disturbances do happen, though. Disturbances are a natural part of life, of ecosystems. Um, fires, for example, is a natural part of um, many ecosystems. What is this diagram trying to show? This diagram is showing recovery from a disturbance. On the top, we have primary succession, where there's actually starting with bare rock. This might be after a volcano, for example. On the bottom, it's a disruption that doesn't go all the way back to bare rock. So there's still some of the ecosystem, some of the biotic um, organisms are still left. But what both of these are have, have in common is showing ecosystem recovery. Ecosystems recover from many natural disturbances, such as fire, through a series of predictable changes. And this is called succession. Now, some ecosystems naturally go through this process of fire and recovery on a fairly regular basis. And the native species are actually well adapted to frequent fires. Other ecosystems, on, on the other hand, um, have very infrequent fi fires. And so it's important to understand sort of the natural response of an ecosystem to disturbances like fire when human management is um, taking place. So we can't just have the same fire management strategy in all ecosystems. We need to understand sort of what happens to the ecosystem naturally when faced with these disturbances. How often historically did fires take place? So I want to leave on sort of a happy note, right? Humans, we know, have some really terrible effects on ecosystems, but it's not all terrible. Humans have some really positive effect on ecosystems, too. Sometimes we realize that we've done something wrong and that we find a way to fix it. Really wonderful example of that is wolves in Yellowstone National Park. In the 1800s, there were a lot of wolves in the area. By the mid-1920s, they had been hunted um, to the point where there were no wolves left in Yellowstone. It took a long time, a lot of decades of people working really hard to make this plan work. But in 1995, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. And over the um, 20 plus years since that's happened, the wolves have um, really impacted the ecosystem. We saw this in previous videos of this unit, how the wolves have had um, a really their keystone species have had a huge positive effect on the ecosystem. Um, and yes, humans caused that original problem, but humans also found a way to fix it. And with that, we're done. That's the end. Congratulations, you guys. We made it through so much material. Um, I hope you found something interesting along the way. Um, this was certainly a really brief overview of trying to study all of life. So I hope that this is just the beginning of uh, a long process of you learning more about how life works. Congratulations.